Every week since January 2014, the purpose of Startup Meetup is pop quiz. Um, Doug, what's the purpose of Startup Meetup? To learn from others. <laughs> to learn from others. When we started out, we thought, what's something that we could do for the community? We all knew that some experiences aren't worth going through if you can have somebody point a shortcut or a better way. So we just had people come in and start telling their stories, and also to be kind of honest about what happens in the startup process and the innovation process. It's, it's not always like this, right? It's more like, like this. And then maybe a uh, tailwind at the end. But, so uh, Patrick Baines is here to talk this week. Let's give him a round of applause for him. From Center City. That's a slot. We appreciate that. Uh, last week we had Frank Coates, the founder of Wheelhouse Analytics plus other companies, and he had great stories about that point I just made. That I think he, his first slide was about how many times he had been fired, <laughs> uh, and he's had multiple exits. So don't let cranky bosses ever tell you uh, not to pursue your dreams. Uh, next week, we have a designer from RJ Metrics. I forget his name. Matt Monahan. Matt Monahan. Uh, so we had the CEO of RJ Metrics out here. That was awesome. And so I'm excited to hear from Matt. Last week at Night Owls, our Wednesday night event, we had a game developer. Skyless Games. Skyless Games. Chris Bennett. And I missed Night Owls. So I don't know how it went. It went great. Um, it was a little slower, but uh, they have a really cool mission. Uh, they kind of partner with um, offshore businesses and build uh, specific uh, specific learning niches. Cool. Um, what else do we have? Well, next week's Night Owls is SCORE. That's S-C-I-O-R. Their new uh, app. New. Uh, company geared at changing the way students interact, high school students interact with colleges, how they figure out where they want to go. Uh, I think the founders described the current model as transactional, but they want to make it more like an interview, like they're dating, and they launched that Wake Forest, and they're growing pretty fast, and they're above the um, uh, historical society. Which makes me want to also mention, like, how many startups do you think are in Westchester? Kyle. Uh, probably like 10. Well, I should ask somebody else. Yeah, like 10. <laughs> <laughs> to me, 10 is a lot. Uh, and I'm, I'm working on trying to get ahead of all of them together because when you drive through Westchester, you wouldn't know it. Uh, so, that's next Wednesday night, 7 to 10. We do that every week. And the other events, oh, uh, this Friday we're doing a build a 3D printer boot camp. And we came up with this idea about, you know, 48 hours ago. And <laughs> we, we had six slots and they all sold out. And we learned how to put this printer together about 72 hours ago and we're racing to be masters at it. But through some funding from the I2N and the Economic Development Council, we went and partied at NextFab for a couple of days and learned a lot about 3D printing. Chad here. Yeah. Wilhelm, Henry, and Chad went. If he is here, he should be downstairs. Yes, together fixing the basics <laughs> for our printer so that on Friday we'll be ready to roll. Wilhelm went. There's Wilhelm. So the idea was, OK, what do we do with this investment? Uh, the best thing to do would be to create more printers and get them into families and houses in our community so that when visitors happen, they get to experience it. And we, if we can do that every month, we could put, by the end of the summer, 50 3D printers in Greater Westchester. That would be a worthwhile goal. So that's what we're going to try to do. And we're going to of course do video and share it. So if you want to know more about that, let us know. Ask Ben or Mary or Wilhelm. Uh, we're already uh, 
kind of two or three people into the next one. So that's exciting for us. Um, we have any film night coming up? Uh, we do have one in July. Jesse's not here. Uh, it features Chris Hogan and Logan. Um, Local guy, tall guy. Yeah. 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 Did I get his name wrong? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, guys. Name wrong. He's a tall guy, filmmaker, local guy. Um, can we introduce Pat? Yes. Okay. Wait. So, just let me shout yeah, out keep going. sponsors. As I said, the Economic Development Council sits here. For, if you have questions for for them, they've been killer sponsors from the beginning of this very event right here. Uh, and the I2N is a funded subsidiary of them that is like a virtual incubator. Uh, so thank you to those folks, um, many people on that team. Fox Rothschild was introduced to uh, us, or we were introduced to them via the I2N at CCDC, and Terry's here somewhere, I guess. Uh, they've had our back uh, and have helped us create the incubator program, so thank you to Fox. And Igniter TV, aka Sean Dominski, has been live streaming all of our 70-something startup meetups. They're all on YouTube, or 94.2% of them. Uh, the other <laughs> percent are somewhere on um, some drive. But all of these events are up there. Uh, Mike and Jaren are doing photos and videos for the summary. And Brennan's office uh, furniture, that came through the CC. EDC too. They gave us some cool furniture. Thank you very much. And the Hankin Group runs a, a wet lab co-working space in Eagle uh, above Exton, and they've been a supporter because we're doing the same thing. And it's key to have a really cheap place uh, to get a couple of uh, desks and work on something without committing to a lease. That's the real function. I think it drives. Uh, drives economic development and jobs, and uh, and I'm totally playing up to the fact that Kathy Kazone is here, co County Commissioner. Uh, let's give her a round of applause for coming in <laughs> and checking out the room. And no, seriously, um, that's the exact reason why we exist, to kind of facilitate this stuff. Uh, we have a new team upstairs. I don't know if they're in the event. Uh, American Philanthropic is a company that was in the row of uh, buildings that got burned down to get extra space. They're now here, and that's pretty cool to have a, a team of eight work home with us upstairs. That's it. I'll shut up. Patrick, we are looking forward to hearing your story uh, and then hitting you with all sorts of q &A. Thanks for coming. Great. Good to be here. Have we, have we officially started? Yeah, well, yes. Patrick. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, the way that this has been broken down for me at least is about 30 minutes of me telling you about myself and sort of the different chapters of my uh, entrepreneurial career and some of the key learnings or lessons uh, along the way and, and both, I think, the lessons of what I learned but how I got into those various positions because um, it, it probably sounds pretty cool on paper but it's like, you know, like anything else in, in reality, it's maybe not as sexy. Um, but uh, I'm happy to, happy to be here. I, I'm my, really my truly first company uh, that I'm doing from scratch on my own, uh, but my second time as a, as a founder. And um, uh, I've been doing the second company for about six months. We started in Benjamin's Desk, a, a co-working space in Center City, which was uh, amazing. It's just great to be around other people. And um, you know, we would be sitting there making calls and working, and other people from the, the floor would just say, hey, you know, if you tried this, or you should talk to this guy, and, and it, was, it was extremely helpful. We loved uh, working out of Benjamin's desk for a few months. We just uh, moved into office space above the Apple Store on 16th and Walnut in Center City, and uh, hopefully be there for uh, a long time. So my name is Patrick Baines. I've been in Philadelphia for six or seven years now. I uh, was an early employee at LinkedIn out of college. Following that, I co-founded a company called PeopleLinks with another guy from LinkedIn. We had a, a kind of a long run learning all of the first time entrepreneurial mistakes before we really figured out what we were doing and got some, some meaningful traction and started to raise money. Since then, PeopleLinks has raised uh, many millions of dollars in venture capital and uh, is a thriving startup in Center City. Uh, after my tenure there and, and um, you know, sort of learning all these different things, I really had an itch to 
go out, use the things I've learned. Um, uh, no real secret, but LinkedIn also IPO'd, and I'm not rich or anything, but I made enough money that I could like place a bet on myself, and that's basically what I'm, what I'm doing this time around. Uh, so I'll start with where I went to school. Uh, anyone in here ever heard of Alfred University? Got two, so that's about the right ratio. Usually it's about 2% of people have heard of where I went to college. Um, and uh, so my, my father's from upstate New York. This is a small, almost liberal arts college in upstate New York. And uh, he went there, my brother went there, my sister went there. So uh, I really didn't have much of a choice. It's a school of about 2,000 people. This was a, um, a hot tub, in quotations, that I put in my uh, freshman dorm room. I'm, it's <laughs> me pictured in the, in the corner there. Uh, and you know, I, I, so I, that's how I got to Alfred was because it was a family thing. Um, you know, I studied business. I didn't, you know, I've got a few little kind of nuggets I took away uh, academically, but there were, I think, really three key things I walked away from, uh, from college with, and, and those things have actually been, um, I think, really key to what took me to the next uh, couple levels in, in my career. Um, the first was how to present, and this is one of the most, you know, some of the best lessons or the most obvious and, and, and uh, in retrospect or in hindsight or whatever. Um, I got up to give a, a presentation in college, maybe my sophomore year, and for the first time, I remember after it was done, going like feeling really good about it, and I was like, what was the difference between that and all the other presentations I gave before that? And I realized it was because I knew what I was talking about for the first time. <laughs> uh, and, and it's no joke, because you, you get sort of fed these templates you know, when you're learning, like, you know, well, here's how you should do your presentation, and here's the subject you should speak on, and all these different things. And, for the first time, I had a subject I was a little bit interested in. I did my research. I actually had my own opinion about it, put together a presentation, and you know, got up and very naturally spoke about the, the topic. It was like around personal finance and, and some things. But I, I got into it, and I just I sat back down at my desk, and I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like, that felt really good. And I realized like, I knew what I was talking about. So that was like lesson number one is, you know, stay, not stay within your competency, but develop your competency and, and leverage that. You know, when you're getting up to talk, uh, knowing what you're going to talk about and having some level of uh, expertise in it uh, takes away uh, a whole lot of, uh, of stress. So it's like simple and, and, and obvious. The second one kind of folds into that. Um, I took a, an acting class, and this was actually one of the more important lessons I learned um, in life and in school. And it was the relationship between a science and an art. Um, somebody I was chatting with earlier was talking about how uh, scary it is to get up and, and you know, speak in public. and. I, I agree, except I've, I've done it enough that it, you know, I'm a little bit accustomed to it. But I took this acting class, and the, uh, the entire semester, the professor taught us all of the different components of acting. So it's things like, and you'll notice them when you watch movies or TV now, uh, actors always use their space. So if I was sitting here right now just like this, you would be pretty bored. But if I have some you know, body language, if I take a drink of my water, if I were to stand up and engage you, it becomes a lot more interesting. And you practice that as an actor. You also learn your lines, and so you know what you're going to say, and then you know when you're going to say it. Uh, and then you practice all of these different components together. And then the, the last week or so before we gave our, our, you know, we had to do these like 15 minute plays, the professor said, okay, all those things we learned all semester. You know, I taught you guys how to use your space, how to know your lines, how to do all these different things, have, have uh, the right body language. He said, forget all of that now, because that's the science. Now you act, and that's the art. And he's like, you know, you kind of put it all out the window. And it's the same is true with anything you're trying to learn. So if you want to be a good writer, you have to learn grammar, you have to learn spelling, learn punctuation, learn how to you know, craft a sentence or copyright. But at some point when you're trying to put together you know, whatever it is you're working on, you sort of have to forget that science and just create the, the message. And then when you do that really well, that, that becomes the art. Same is true if you're going into a new industry and you're starting a company, uh, or particularly if you're just starting a company, know the components of the business that you're trying to solve. Know the architecture of the business. Know what's most important first. But at some point, those things are just the science, and you have to use your instincts, and, and you have to rely on the art. Um, you know, I can give a million examples, but any, any artist or painter you know, has to know how the colors are going to mix and how things work on canvas for sculpture. But then they kind of forget all that, and, they just, and then they make it happen. Um, the third thing was figuring out who I was. And by the time I left college, I had studied abroad. I had um, you know, a few different sets of experiences, but I was actually pretty self-aware that you know, I was an American. Uh, I was pretty lucky to be born in this country. I had um, you know, a lot of opportunity to do anything. I, I, I felt like I could do anything. Um, but I had some awareness about myself and, and sort of where I was at in the world. And 
that you know, nobody's going to do it for me and I could kind of pave my own path. And, and sort of knowing who I was was really important. Um, and we'll go to uh, chapter two, which would really be LinkedIn. So when I left college, the, 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 the uh, yeah, so this one I'm not in a, a pool, but um, uh, maybe, a, maybe a second closest thing. But I'd, um, I left college still wearing the same pair of Birkenstocks I have on, and not the same pair, I actually go through multiple pairs a year. Um, but I, I was wearing you know, Birkenstocks and very casual, and, and I just didn't see myself uh, wanting to change who I was for a job. So going and working in finance and having to shave and put on a suit and kind of become part of a system wasn't really that attractive to me. Um, I saw a video of what it was like to work at Google, saw what the culture was like. This was 2000, probably six or something. And I said, you know, startups and technology companies and that type of culture looks like an area where I could thrive and, and not have to compromise on my, on my values. And I had um, started looking for startups. Of course, I chucked my resume in at Google and YouTube and never heard back from uh, a lot of these different companies. But I was, I was smart enough to use Google search, uh, Google news search regionally and so um, I was looking for opportunities in cities where I had friends and family where I was you know, maybe inclined to move. I, so I used Google News Search in Omaha, Nebraska. I typed in startup. I saw a press release that this company called LinkedIn was going to be opening an office there in the next few months. It said, you know, if you're interested, send an email to A. Kelly at LinkedIn, who's the director. Didn't have a LinkedIn profile. I uh, just saw it was a cool startup. I sent her an email with my resume. I said, you know, I'll be visiting Creighton, uh, looking at the MBA program. I'd love to come meet with you. Sat down. They hadn't even opened an office yet. And um, a week later, she made me a job offer. LinkedIn has a, a large presence in Omaha, Nebraska. It, it follows the uh, footsteps of PayPal, or, or a lot of its operations do, because it was early. A lot of early PayPal people started LinkedIn. PayPal employs about three to 5,000 people in Omaha. And so they saw the same growth happening with LinkedIn. And, and I was the 162nd employee opening this office in Omaha that they expected to be this huge operation, but because LinkedIn members, most of them don't pay, they were actually able to scale down the level of support compared to PayPal. And so we had an account management, inside sales, outside sales, and customer service office um, that I sort of stumbled into uh, out of college. Worked there for two years. Um, a, a couple of the big takeaways, this one may be helpful for, for a lot of people. It was, it was really helpful to me. I, um, Learned by the, end of, by the end of my two years at LinkedIn, so I was there for two years, and, and by the way, people always wanted to know back then, why would you leave LinkedIn? Why did you leave LinkedIn? Um, I left because I was, applying to, I was applying internally for different jobs that were like entry level jobs and, and being beat out by people who worked at Google and Deloitte and went to Stanford and Duke and all. And I can tell you the people who took the jobs that I was like a final candidate for, and it's like, it's all good. I would have hired them if I was the hiring manager over me too. But um, you couldn't, I couldn't grow at that stage of the company, and I wasn't fulfilled. I, I was playing 30 minutes to an hour of hacky sack every day, and um, that, was, that was my day. Uh, so it was fun. I had you know, some good challenges there, but, but that's why I left. So the, the, one of the most important lessons I learned, though, was when I was going to people for advice, like career advice, and at this point, like, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I'd found an industry I liked. But... I found that when I would go to somebody for advice, I was getting the advice of what they would do. Again, the, so I think some of the best lessons are the most obvious. So my, my father is a colonel in the army. He's a character, but he's a colonel in the army. And so you ask him, you know, hey, Dad, I think I, I told him I wanted to go in the Peace Corps at one point. And he's like, you know, you'll never make any money in the Peace Corps. And I'm just thinking, I want to learn another language, live in another country. And so we had, that, those were my goals, you know, but his is like, job security, work for the government, you know, all these things. And so I was like, well, that doesn't sound right. So, but I discarded the Peace Corps because of that. Thank, I mean, I'm not going to say thank God, but um, I visited friends in the Peace Corps, so I kind of checked that box, but uh, <laughs> without, without all the diseases that they got. I, I'm not joking. My friend did get pretty sick. Um, but, uh, and then I went to my, the, my boss at LinkedIn, who was this, like, amazing, successful woman, you know, just lights up a room, and she was just incredible, and I thought, you know, she'll have the right advice for me. I, I told her I was thinking about leaving at one point, or I was having kind of an open discussion with her, and she's a very uh, Midwestern woman. You know, I think it's like God at first and then work, and that's all good. Everyone has their values. But she looked at my scenario and said, you know, I think you can find everything you're looking for right here in Omaha. Like, 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 because that was her value set, right? So I'm sitting there like, that doesn't match up. 
Um, you know, like that can't be true. That doesn't feel right to me. And so I started to evolve. And I, when I told my dad I was going to quit my job at LinkedIn, he, he freaked out. Um, and so I waited a month, and then I quit. And uh, uh, but I, I started to go. One of my uncles started a company in the '70s called Maple Ridge Farms. It's a wholesaler of corporate food gifts. And so I, I got some exposure to to, um, to that world uh, growing up. I started to go to him for advice, and it was always on point. You know, he was like, "Oh well, you know, when I was selling cars, you know, that's when I realized I could sell things." And he just sort of had like these different sort of fundamental lessons, and he could point me in the right direction very quickly. The same is now true as, as I've you know grown uh, and, and moved further in my career. When I'm you know at a crossroads or in a tough place, I just look like who is there, who who's already been there that's done this, who can like very easily uh, show me the path, and it makes all the difference because I think when we're at any stage of our career, we're tempted to go to the smartest person we know or you know, the most successful or somebody in our family that we trust for advice. Um, but you're going, to get, you're going to get their advice, right? of course, from their value system. And so sometimes it doesn't always match up. Um, that was one of the bigger, bigger lessons I, I learned at LinkedIn. Um, you know, all in all, it was a great experience. I think the other most important one, and this is something I think is both a trap for people um, and, uh, and, and a phenomenal opportunity. This was actually a really important lesson. Um, I, I believe that the way we look at businesses and, and, and maybe the way we look at a lot of things as an individual is through the frameworks that we've developed, right? And so for, the, I think, the guys at RJ Metrics, I can use them as an example. They were both uh, working at a venture capital firm, saw a lot of different businesses, saw the problem around uh, data analytics, and then you know, left that and started a business very much using all the things they learned over the last two years. You'll find somebody who will be you know, in landscaping, and they've got this great idea for a landscaping app, right? Uh, you've got, you know, and, and anybody, I mean, how many people are here are starting a business based on some previous experience or something that they're, they're leveraging? Not uncommon. So at LinkedIn, I had the good fortune of seeing one of the most, I, I think, best business models in technology. And, and I always knew what it was. We, t we had weekly meetings with the whole company, and you got to, a lot of exposure to it. Um, and so when I look at businesses, I look at it with the framework of LinkedIn. I'm trying in my new company to uh, emulate some of the, the, that sort of strength in the architecture of LinkedIn's business. And so it's, it's basically along the lines of um, LinkedIn has multiple revenue streams, so one product that it can monetize in a, in a few very meaningful ways. And when LinkedIn launched, it didn't know if it was going to hit on all those different revenue streams, but it knew it was poised to own recruiting and uh, talent management software, to uh, own uh, professional identities and advertising through that to that demographic, um, to own premium subscriptions, and, and not only just selling talent solutions to corporations, but that individuals would upgrade for more access to the network. Um, and we would talk about all these things. And it also has a uh, one, the, the the advertising one is a media uh, business model. But we would talk about all these things, and it was like, wow, we're building this one great product totally focused on just growth and then knowing that it, it could open up these different opportunities. LinkedIn also has a, a network grows business business model. So as the network grows every month and adds three, four million new people, all of its different revenue streams are fed accordingly. So if, you know, it adds four million new professionals that adds to ad inventory. Those four million, a percentage of them are going to upgrade to the premium subscriptions. Uh, a percentage of them become prospects for their corporate solutions one core product. Uh, and so they really thought through kind of what the world would look like if they were successful and where they could operate. And, and it, it's, it's reaped a lot of rewards for them today. People Inks, which is uh, chapter, I guess, three, is my, my next company. This one is one of those things where it, it can look really sexy. Um, and now I'm just going to kind of like, you know, tell you the, the, the reality of it. But it is, it is actually still, you know, a pretty, uh, it's a great company and all these things. But um, I'll tell you how we started. It's kind of funny. So I left LinkedIn, as I was saying, because I wasn't um, feeling fulfilled or challenged. I wanted to grow a little bit faster. Um, and this guy, Nathan Egan, who I had never met, was a remote sales executive, one of the first remote sales executives for LinkedIn on the East Coast. He's from Philadelphia. And um, Nathan had sort of gone out, uh, out of LinkedIn in you know, the classic I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of leave it at that, but he had actually pitched the idea for PeopleLinks, what's now PeopleLinks, to the founders of LinkedIn. Um, kind of went over okay, but he parted ways and, and left the, the business. Um, and from that, from that point, Nathan uh, didn't have all the luxuries of like, you know, really thinking through the architecture of a business. This is his fir first time starting a company, he had family that was entrepreneurs. 
Um, but he reached out to me and said, hey, look, I've left LinkedIn. I'm going to start this company. I don't know exactly what it's going to be yet, uh, but I can sell. And he's a sales guy. And, and we started selling consulting and training programs around social media to really anybody who had money and that would buy. And we, we did that almost exclusively for two years. Nathan, about three months out of the gate, closes like a quarter million dollar deal with AARP. I mean, it was like amazing. And you, keep, you think that those deals are just going to keep coming. But, um, you know, when in the consulting business, you sell something you have to deliver. And um, so we spent just as much time, if not more time, delivering as, as we did selling. Business did, did pretty well. Uh, we were able to bridge um, when we needed to through friends and family. After a while, we sort of realized what the market was really asking for. And it was um, education. People wanted to understand social media. And then they wanted to as we kind of distilled it down, they wanted to improve the quality of the profiles, the quality of the networks, um, and the quality of the activity, what people were doing on LinkedIn. So we said, okay, companies want to optimize their use of LinkedIn. We are subject matter experts. We're well-branded. We're from LinkedIn. Let's launch a platform to do this. LinkedIn also opened their API uh, during that time period. So we created our first sort of basic e-learning you know, uh, uh, product, the MVP. I've got this killer sort of uh, voiceover where I did all the voiceover. I wrote all the early scripts. I mean, you know, doing all the sort of ugly legwork. And we had this you know, pretty modern uh, e-learning software with some login with LinkedIn and a couple of recommendations of, hey, you work at Comcast, add the word Comcast to your summary. Um, from that, we were able to uh, you know, go through Ben Franklin, raise money through Ben Franklin, get some angel investors, get some venture capital investors. And then um, you know, at one point, we were about 40 employees. LinkedIn pulled our API access uh, in May of last year, um, us with about a couple dozen other companies. Um, one of the revenue streams LinkedIn didn't fully anticipate uh, launching was a sales solution. And then they launched that about two years ago. And, and when they launched it, they said, oh, well, now we've got kind of an ecosystem of potential competitors, including every CRM system and other widgets that people had built. Why are we going to foster an ecosystem of competitors? And I spent about six months flying back and forth between San Francisco and like having these discussions with them. Um, API access was ultimately pulled. We lost uh, almost zero customers uh, from a business that has you know, 75 Fortune 500 customers and all these big enterprises using us. We've uh, realized one of our lessons was that we weren't actually, it didn't impede us from uh, delivering uh, what we had set out to deliver for our customers. It only affected our data source that said, did they do what we suggested or, or did they make progress on something? So we switched to our own login. We've replaced since then the data source with sa uh, Salesforce and other, other data points and CRMs. We still have other integrations. Um, and, the, and the company is back on, on track and, and growing just as strong as it was a year, a year ago. So that's going really well. I saw an opportunity there where after five, six years with uh, people links, I think it was about five years and some months, uh, there's a lot of noise. There's going to be a lot of change. We uh, brought in a new, we made our, our chief operating officer, our CEO. Nathan, uh, my co-founder, tells me we're going to go to lunch. I'm like, oh, this is, this is my opportunity. Like, if I want to transition out, I can do it really you know, quietly at this point. There's so much noise going on that it's a kind of a good time. And he's like, you know, we're going to reorg. I think we're going to do these things. I said, you know, Nathan, maybe it's a good time for me just to kind of roll with everything. And, you know, we're cutting costs and all those things. And uh, that, that, that worked. And it worked really well. And, um, and the, you know, at the same time, I, you know, was not, we'd hired, People Links has some of the most amazing talent working there um, that I was not critical. Like, I, I was sitting there. I was obviously a VP level executive operator, you know, co-founder, whatever. And we had a chief marketing officer, a chief operating officer, uh, you know, VP of sales, all these guys that are 10 times better at what they're doing than I could ever be. And so it was like, I don't want their jobs. They're, be they're going to do better than I can do. And, and I used to just be sort of like the, you know, whatever. I was going in on the executive sales calls, or I was helping do a, a presentation, or I was on the road speaking or doing conferences. I was like the, you know, put the founder out there, and he'll fix it kind of, or he'll make it better type of job. And I was fine with that. But Anyway, uh, transition out of people links. Biggest lessons at people links. Um, the first was, I would say, uh, I learned just about everything that I'm you know, OK at or pretty good at in my career, I learned at people links. So my ability to present, my ability to um, be on sophisticated sales calls and sell into enterprises, uh, to make beautiful PowerPoints, excuse me. Um, but things that very tactical to very strategic, I really got, I, I, I learned a lot there. So that was the first, is I now had kind of like a toolkit of, of things that I could work with. Um, the second was, I talked about the beautiful architecture of uh, LinkedIn, 
people links was a constant iteration, right? So we knew there was a problem, we knew we had a solution, and we just sort of continued iterating our solution towards that problem set and iterating our marketing and our sales. And you know, there are times you just sort of want to like pause everything and say like, okay, let's take a breath, let's think about you know what markets we're going after. People links does you know has again very smart people is doing a very good job, but that was just an itch I always wanted to scratch. I wanted to know you know, strategically what my plan was, uh, you know, out of the gate and then be able to operate on a plan and iterate on a plan. And if you hear the founders of LinkedIn talk about it sometimes, they, the business plan that they wrote for the original business is like a work of art. I mean, it still holds true today in terms of what the big bets that they thought would be true if they could own professional identities and the revenue streams and all these things. And I kind of wanted to do that. And I felt like, you know, that was, that was always a, a great opportunity. Um, so that was the other one, is the, sort of the importance of, um, of architecture. It's kind of a fun exercise I would encourage you guys to do for yourselves and for your teams and, and you know, no matter what business you're in, um, was how to rally people behind a vision. And, and you know, more than that, I did see this a lot at LinkedIn, um, but I never got to see it as close up and personal as I did when we hired um, Kevin, the, the new CEO of PeopleLinks. So there's about five or six people at the company at this point. Kevin comes on board. And one of the first things he did is, and I think he, you know, I could have now in, in hindsight, I could see it from a mile away. I just didn't, I was too, too in it at the time to, to notice it. But nobody had a growth mindset, you know, except for maybe Nathan, who's the sales guy. And I'm sitting there just trying to create good customer experiences. I was doing customer uh, delivery. And, um, but nobody was thinking like growth, growth, growth all the time. And, and none of the employees were. Everyone's just reacting and doing what they're doing. So Kevin comes in, gets us all in a room. Uh, writes a couple categories on the wall, like you know, PR, sales, how many employees are we going to have? Starts asking like really kind of interesting questions about where the business is going to be in six months. So he says like, how many employees are we going to have? We're like, oh, we're going to have 40 employees, and like, where are we going to be in in the news? We're we're going to be on Inc. and Forbes, and um, you know, how many customers are we going to have? We're going to have 60 customers, and he gets everybody answering these questions, and he's going around writing them on the board. And then he, uh, the last thing he does, he said, okay. You guys believe all this stuff that you're telling me. And we're like, yeah, we believe it. He goes, that's how you think about the company today, not in six months. And that's how you talk about the company today. He's like, I'm not asking you to lie to anybody, but if somebody says, we had one uh, large financial services customer. He goes, Patrick, how many customers do we have in financial services? And the truth would be one. But the, the, the answer would be, we are talking to everyone in financial services. By the end of the year, we're going to have 12 of the largest banks using, using our software, over a dozen. You, know? like you, you, you start to think and talk like you're six months out, and it paints the path. But it, more than that, like it gets you juiced and thinking about what you're working on and why you're doing it. And um, It was just a really great exercise. And Kevin can do a, a million different things like that to get people jacked up. But um, you know, if, if you are always thinking about what you're doing that week and that month, you miss the like, you know, I'm actually doing this because I, I think we're, you know, we have the opportunity to be in Inc. or the opportunity to be in Forbes, and I think that we're going to be, um, you know, working with all these great companies. You start to live it, and it's about it's about living that that out. Um, so that was that was also key. And, and Kevin, one another thing I learned from Kevin was, uh, you know, I said something uh, one time. This was early when I was working with him. I didn't realize like how you know special his his sort of gift was. Uh, but you know, Kevin would always get on calls or in meetings, and he would have questions and not answers. And he would always just ask really good questions. And I was first working with him, I was like, Kevin, I need answers, not questions. And um, and, and I didn't realize that what he was actually doing was like bringing out the you know he's motivating people, he's bringing out the best in them. And like Kevin can just ask his his famous question, which is a fun one to use internally, and I abused it once I picked up on it. Is how do we get to where we need to be? Which is like one of the most vague questions in the world. But Kevin can literally go into any meeting knowing nothing about what's going on, sit down for five minutes and go, okay, how do we get to where we need to be? And like, no shit, three people have the answer. They're like, well, Kevin, we need to do this, we need that. And he's like, okay, how do we do it? And they're like, okay, well, here's how we do it. And he's like, great. You know, like, and he just would, could get people really jacked up around that, around that saying. So um, kind of rallying people behind a vision. And so what Kevin does when he's doing that is you might have a bunch of people that are on a scale of one to 10 performing at a six or a seven, but by the time you get through with those types of interactions, and all Kevin's doing is asking questions and motivating. Everyone's working on a 10 or an 11. I mean, they, it really you know, brings out the best in people, and that was key. So Nathan and I, and, and by the way, we remain very close with people links, all very good friends. Nathan and I, um, you know, I, I used to describe us as though we were like brothers and boyfriend and girlfriend. We're like, we'll always love each other and be able to hug it out, but like we push each other's buttons all the time. Um, but he's a great guy, and um, you know, he's the guy who sort of brought me into, into this world uh, to some degree. Taught me how to make nice PowerPoints, too. 
Um, so the new venture is called Game Time Updates. When I left PeopleLinks, and Ben, I think you can switch slides, um, but when I, um, when I left PeopleLinks, I wanted to take a little bit of time off. I went surfing in Costa Rica. I went and visited a guy uh, named Davis Smith, who has a company called Cotopaxi. Anybody heard of this guy? He's uh, he, uh, founded the largest e-commerce sites in Brazil, and I saw him speak at Penn, and when, um, he invited me out to his house, so I went and visited him for a day. Broke my hip zip lining in three places uh, on his, on his uh, log cabin and spent uh, about two or three weeks in recovery at his place before they like wheelchaired me to my parents for another three weeks recovery. So that's what I did after people links. Um, but I, I came back into Philly, uh, really no set plan. Um, a friend of mine owns a couple media companies, recruited me to be the CEO of a new one he wanted to start. And I worked on it for three months, and it was like marrying. I, I mean, not, I wouldn't. This isn't the best way to describe it, but I'll say it was a little bit like marrying for money. It was like really attractive opportunity. I, you know, God, I'd be so lucky to to do this. Um, right people, but kind of wrong product for me. It wasn't. My heart wasn't in it. And when I iterated on the business plan a, a few really good times, and we all felt really good about the path forward. I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you know, this isn't this isn't for me. Like, I just I'm not the guy to go on this journey. Uh, and it was hard to walk away from that. I wouldn't have had to, you know, wouldn't have had any challenges really around raising uh, capital or anything. I mean, it was just it was a really sweet um, it was a, it was a sweet deal. But it wasn't again. It's like marrying for money. You don't want to do that. So, game time updates was an idea I had about four or five years earlier when I was bartending. Uh, when we were starting people, like maybe six years earlier. And um, was just sort of a fun idea I had on the shelf, and then I, I thought more about it, and I thought, you know, that's something that I think I can take to market myself with sort of little, you know, not not a lot of capital. Um, I think I can, you know, uh, it can have some of the attributes in businesses that I like. I think it can have multiple revenue streams. I think it can have a media business and a subscription revenue business and a B two B sales business. And I think these things are inside of it. Uh, and so I scrapped together a, a pretty basic business plan just for myself. I got one of my best friends from college to um, help me out with it. And before we had a product, before we had a website, before we had anything, I actually said to him, I said, you know, it's like day one of, of, the, begin of the new company. I'm like, what, you know, what would Kevin O'Neill do, the CEO of people? And it's like, Kevin O'Neill would just start <coughs> selling it. Like, let's just start calling on people. Let's just start introducing them to game time updates. Let's try, let's try to close a deal and just see what, what we learn and what happens. So before we did anything, before we launched a website, before we did anything, we just started pounding phones and calling bars and restaurants, and we, we sold it um, to, to one customer, and we you know, kind of duct taped a solution together for them, and, uh, and it worked. And then we you know, started to put a little bit of muscle and, and energy into um, you know, different components of, of the business and started executing. Um, so I'll tell you what Game Time Updates is, and I probably should have told you guys what PeopleLinks is if you didn't know, but um, Game Time Updates is social marketing software for bars, restaurants, and beverage companies. Um, we have created an um, automated way of delivering uh, sports updates to bars and restaurants. So if you're a bar that's just going to show the Phillies every time the Phillies are on, we can say, stop into McGillan's, watch the Phillies at 7 p.m. And, uh, and then if you want additional customization like drink specials and custom sports, we can do that and we charge a fee for it. Uh, what's, what's happening right now is that we've acquired about 25 customers in a few months. We lost, paying us about $100 a month. We lost more than half of them. So if there's this business cycle, I think it goes like, first get good at um, your, you know, developing leads, then get good at reaching out to those leads, however you're doing it. Get good at uh, uh, what, I, what we call um, uh, getting, tr uh, I think it's like acquiring trial customers or dropping mics, where you're like, I've tried you four times, like drop the mic. And then the next is like customer retention, which is really where we're focused right now is like how can we keep these guys on board. So we got pretty good at the subscription model. We learned the product. We had a lot of really key learnings there. And then we said, okay, let's now start to bring in some big sponsors. And we started talking with Anheuser-Busch and Heineken and a lot of these big brands. And we started giving away basic service, which opens up our media business. So now we give bars basic access to game time updates for free. And in doing that, they expect sponsors from these alcohol beverage companies to come into the stream. Um, and it's a really unique audience for these beverage companies who um, invest a lot of marketing dollars into helping these retail locations sell more product. And they don't have access. Now, now we have access. Game Time Updates has access to publish to all of the customers of those, of those bars and retail locations really on demand in real time. And, and it, it kind of blends in with all the other marketing programs that a lot of these guys have going on. So that's sort of where we've arrived to six months in. Um, 
you know, we've got, we've, we've validated a couple business models. We're starting to launch some of the larger B2B ones. Um, you'll see in the next few months, like, I'm going to basically scrap everything that we've, uh, not everything, but like our website, um, some of our product work, some of the things we're going to scrap, we're going to relaunch. Um, now that we kind of know who we are a little bit better, we know the, the marketplace a little bit better. And, um, you know, I have not put a lot of time or energy into the site. So um, that's kind of game time updates. I, I think, you know, the, the big key learnings for me so far have been systems and processes. So I heard this quote the other day, if you can do something twice, you've repeated it. If somebody else can do it, it's repeatable. Um, and in order to have something be repeated, you have to know what it was the first time. And so you have to kind of document when you're selling, when you're marketing, you're emailing, you're doing whatever, if you can write out the steps for how you did that, well, now you can hand it off to someone. But more importantly, you can iterate on it and go, are those the right steps? Is this working? Is it not working? What can you change in or out? I've iterated on our, we have everything in the business documented to a T, I'm not everything, but a lot of the really important stuff, and I've iterated on them three to four really solid, painful times where I have to stop what I'm doing, spend a whole day, and go back through our sales docs and our marketing docs and go, okay, what's the new message? What's the new, like, why is this not working? How can we make this a little bit better? And then I have myself, my business partner, we got one full-time contractor and four interns that are pounding phones for us with an incentive to, to get bars using our, our platform. Um, so systems and processes have been really critical to, to iterating. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm happy to tell you guys anything you want to know. So I think we're going we're gonna to do Q&A. Let's, let's open it up. I just came over here to see yeah. uh, open it up. Are you using cool. People links, so I, we are using Salesforce <laughs> CRM aggressively, which I never really um, did a great job of in, earlier in my career. People links, uh, I would love to use to use People links on my Salesforce um, right now. People links is really is the value for People links goes up the more people you you have on the platform. So for one or two people, like we'll get some incremental value. But if you're a large company and you have a thousand people on it, you're going to get major lift. Um, so it's just not that necessarily the best uh, best for uh, for our size. Um, so interns are, are crazy helpful. I think that the um, you know the sort of secret to getting a, a large candidate pool is to get your postings live on the uh, internal job boards of the universities, and then you get floodgates of applicants. I think the kids can literally check boxes and like apply to many. Um, and so yeah, for, for, I mean I get for every uh, every semester if you want to call it or in the summertime I get 100 applicants. Um, and then, you know, just like you would anybody else, like, I didn't, I learned, you know, it's these little things that, that, little things that make a big difference. But, you know, we don't, we discard uh, based on resume, and then we always do a 10 minute phone screening to make sure that, like, there's some alignment, expectations are set. This is the, the, the you know, you are interested in sort of pre-qualifies, so we're not wasting our time going through, you can't invite 80 kids in to come and interview. Um, and then we pick some of the best and come, have them come in and interview and so forth. But job, the job boards of universities is really the like, it's the, that's the, what you want to call it, the honey pot or the beehive or whatever. Yeah. Um, Jim Brown, Jim Brown, Jim Brown, Jim Brown, Jim Brown, Jim Brown. Jim Brown. Uh, question, you talked about making that turn with um, where you were charging the bars, but then you realized charging the big industry, beverage industry. Uh, I guess I, I'm a little lost. Like how, how does that work? So the bars all use your app for free. And then how does Budweiser end up paying the bill? Well, so they, they don't pay the bill for the bar. Um, we, we basically are now giving away a, a free basic version of the platform. If the bar wants to upgrade and, and customize it and do those things, they can. But with the free version, same as on LinkedIn, when you're on the free version, you know, you're know you going to get uh, ads. You pick up a magazine or whatever, You know, there's going to be ads in there. So they expect it. Um, and uh, we say you know, it's going to come from what we're going to know before anything comes out. But, you know, if you're, let's just, you know, pick any bar that you know, and they're saying stop in, see the Phillies, and then, you know, Miller Lights are $3 each, or there's a separate whole Miller Light campaign happening, like, Cole Miller, you know, it's very native advertising, and so it's basically selling native advertising to those groups. Um, and, you know, the bars are trying to push more Miller Light anyway, so it's, uh, and then, you know, if they don't like the ad, they can, they can get rid of it. Nice. Or they can upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mike, talk to me about your work with Capital. You said we want to think forward. Where are we going to be in six months? But the key thing initially, you said projecting that, externally projecting that. 
give me a little bit more meat on the bone there. There's that fine line of, I totally this is where we're going to be, and it's great, man, but you know, the truth is today is not quite there. Yeah, so I, the first thing I think is know your audience, right? Um, you know, the context for which we do is we, you know, and I, I totally get the ethical moral compass around like telling the truth and lying and all those things. But if I am, you know, my, my first goal is I've got to build a business, I've got to live, we've got to thrive. And so I would be foolish if a financial, if I'm sitting down with Goldman Sachs and they say, how many customers do you have in financial services? And I have three options. One is I have one customer, period. Or I can say, we're talking to dozens of financial services companies. Um, by the end of the year, I, we'll, we'll probably have, you know, we're, we're, on, we're on track, to, we're on pace to have more than a dozen. Um, you know, uh, if you'd like to, to see some of the work we've done with Prudential, I'd be happy to, to show you. Just a, it's just a different answer, um, but it's the truth. You know, we were on pace, you know, we are getting customers, I do believe it. Um, and you have to believe it internally. That I think the, you know, the, the larger trick is around transparency. Like, what if, you, what if you're in a larger company and somebody says that to you from the top, but you really have no idea, and now you're out there projecting, you know, it's maybe not, not true at all because you don't have the facts. Like, I knew where we were at, but I knew also how to say the right thing. Now, if I'm talking to, you know, an advisor or a potential investor, somebody I really need to get, you know, uh, under the hood of what we're doing and get their help, I'm going to say, look, we've got one customer right now. I need to get on a clip of two to three more, um, and I don't, you know, I need help. Like, I'm going to be honest. To, like, you're not honest. I'd say, I'm honest in both. I'm going to be more transparent um, in that type of, type of environment because it's going to help me more. Um, and you know, I, I don't, and I don't know that the Goldman Sachs wouldn't mind hearing that you just have one customer financial services, but they're going to like hearing that you're getting a lot of traction in financial services. So you have to find the right way to say it. Um, but it, it, you also have to believe it, you know. And uh, if you, if you just, yeah, I can believe that I have one customer because I have one customer. If I believe that I'm going to have twelve by the end of the year, like I'm going to tell you what I believe. Um, and I think that's where you, where you have to align with that. So. It's, it, but I'll tell you, it, it definitely can feel a little funny, but when you do it the right way like once and you, it, you see kind of the effect it can have on whether it's your employees or it's the person you sat down to meet with, you're like, that was the right move. Because um, people get excited by it, uh, whatever it is. It's, you have to believe where you're going to be. I mean, LinkedIn, we had these weekly meetings where the CEOs of LinkedIn would get up and talk. They'd pull up the heads of product, the heads of sales, the heads of marketing, give these quick 10-minute updates of where we're at. And the guy would pull together how we're on pace to be the world's largest professional social network. We had 40 million members, you know, and we're on track to be, you know, we're nowhere, you know, what does that mean? You don't know what it means, but you, you just can believe that we are going to be, we're going to own professional identities. And people, I got so many people busting my balls for working at LinkedIn in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, Oh, Patrick LinkedIn, my resume, like, you know, people really, like, thought it was a joke, and I was like, yeah, that's, you know, whatever. Like, I, you know, I just sort of shrugged off, and I, I was a little bit embarrassed by it. You know, not, like, embarrassed to be working there, but just that socially, it was, seemed like the dorky thing to do. So, whatever you can do to get people believing, you know, and I, I could have said to them, you know, we're going to come in, it's going to own your professional identity for the rest of your life. Like, I didn't have that language, so it's just kind of having the right language to understand what it is you're really doing. Because um, you have all these different options, too. Any other questions? Ben? Um, I'm interested to hear about um, LinkedIn's culture or PeopleLink's culture as it relates to maybe your, um, well, your assessment of it, but also like your um, process in founding PeopleLink's and, and your conscious decisions to, uh, to cultivate that within your own organization. I mean, I, I think it's, so when I was saying earlier how, you know, I think when you're thinking of businesses, you sort of emulate your own experiences. I, people Links, no doubt, has emulated um, Nathan and my experience working at LinkedIn. People have said when you're in the office, you feel like you, you know, got off on the floor and you're in Silicon Valley a little bit. Um, and, you know, we've got the bean bags and the ping pong tables and the beer and all those fun things. And, and I think that's all really important. I mean, in, in our new office, the first things I did were order Mario Kart 64, uh, foosball table, you know, stereo, and all these sort of things because you want people to want to come into work every day and to, to like the culture, particularly when you're getting help from um, interns, but when you're also not able to pay people a lot of money and you just want them to be attracted to, to, to the opportunity for those reasons. So, um, you know, I think, I think we certainly from an uh, a, a environmental standpoint have, have architected or modeled off of, off of you know, LinkedIn and other, other sort of West Coast companies. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the hard part about culture, at least for me, is I'm not Kevin O'Neill, the CEO of PeopleLinks, who, got, I mean, the guy just is, like, constantly juiced and can get people motivated, and he's there all the time. Like, I, I realize that if I go home at 4.30, like, everyone's going home at 
you know, and if I'm, uh, you know, screwing around, no one else is, everyone's not going to take it seriously. If I'm not keeping myself accountable and doing those things, then, then that's not going to And that's where culture is more intangible and harder to, harder to nail. Um, I think one, one of the things that I've, I've shifted my mindset to, I was talking about this earlier, is the must versus should. You know, like, there's times where you should do something. So I'm going to talk about the art of procrastination and, and how procrastination works. People are procrastinating because they should do something. But when you must do it, you always get it done. And, um, and I'm sort of trying to make that shift in my head. Like, I must do these things for reasons that, you know, some I, I don't even know. But, like, I must work harder. I must do these for, for cultural reasons, for performance reasons. And, yeah, uh, when it all comes on you, it's like you have to. But um, that, I don't know, that's the culture answer, I guess, a little bit. Great. Well, Patrick will be here for a little while to hang out. You can talk to him on your own. We'll be doing a little interview with you as a wrap-up. So, big round of applause.